Hello everyone and welcome to Mountain Lake Journal. I'm Tom Halleck. Just as many Canadians have been following our election and new president, many on this side of the border follow politics in Canada. Those who do certainly will recognize Gilles Decep. For 20 years he has been the driving force behind Quebec's separatist movement as leader of the Bloc Québécois. This is what positive politics can do. Justin Trudeau's landslide victory in the fall of 2015 gave the Liberals the majority in Parliament. <laughs> but it also dashed the hopes of Gilles Decep to win back many of the seats his Bloc Québécois party had lost over the past decade in both Ottawa and Quebec. Decep was defeated in his own riding in Montreal's East End. In the past year, he stepped away from politics, overseeing the theater at Place des Arts in Montreal named in honor of his father, Jean Decep, a celebrated stage and television actor. And some of the passion that has long driven Decep's fight for Quebec's independence took him back to Parliament Hill recently to convince the House of Commons to issue a formal apology, which it did this past month, for a dark chapter in Canada's history that also touched his family. An era now brought to light on the stage of Jean Decep Theatre. Jill Decep joins us now, a longtime and well-known political leader in Canada, a former member of the Parliament and former leader of the Bloc Québécois. Welcome. It is good to see you. We appreciate you being here and joining us. How is life after so many years in politics? Well, I think uh, not as uh, I'm not as active as in, uh, I was in politics. I mean, you, obviously, but still, uh, uh, I talk to a lot of people. I'm making a political analysis with uh, CTV uh, once a month. Uh, I'm the president of the uh, theater fam family theater company, uh, La Compagnie Jean Duceppe, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, when I have the chance to to uh, to uh, intervene for some causes, I don't hesitate. And speaking so. of that, uh, you've done that just within the past few months, talking with the Prime Minister, talking with members of Parliament, asking the House of Commons to issue a formal apology on behalf of Canada. Now, a lot of people may not be familiar with the story behind that motion. Uh, for more than a century, about 100,000 orphaned, abandoned, or poor children were dispatched to Canada from the British Isles to live and in many cases work in Canada. And known as the British Home Children, exactly. many of them were treated horribly and, and exploited? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. It started in around 1840 and it stopped in Canada, I think, in 1948. It went on in Australia till 1970. Mm -hmm. And it happened also in New Zealand. But in Canada, 100,000, it means that we do represent between 10 to 12.5 percent of the Canadian population, between 3.5 million and 4 million people. And that was an unknown story. And uh, in 210, uh, that was the in, uh, International Year of the British Home Children. Uh, that year, Great Britain and Australia apologized. We had a debate in the House of Commons in, two, in December 209. And uh, I made during that uh, debate, I made a speech and I asked Canada to apologize. It was refused by the member who moved the motion, so it was impossible to do. But this year, since uh, we were, were playing a, a play at the uh, Compagnie Jean Duceppe, it, it's uh, about the British home children, but in Australia. But I said uh, two, two weeks ago, well, I mean, it's, imp uh, it's time to Canada to apologize. So I called the Bloc Québécois, they tabled a motion, and they talked to the uh, NDP and to Elizabeth May, the, the, the leader of the Green Party in, in Canada. And I said, uh, I'll talk to the uh, Tories and to uh, the Liberal. So I talked to the Tories and I talked to Justin Trudeau also. I said, well, it's time, we, sh we should do something. Uh, the House of Commons sh should uh, apologize. And I think it's just normal, we did it, Australia did it, Great Britain did it, Canada did it for the Ukrainians, did it for the Italians, for the Japanese, why not for the British home children? I mean, the descendants were representing over 10% of the population. And it was unanimous, finally. And uh, I think uh, it's, uh, it's important to do so, for any society to recognize the errors that were made. And for you, 
personally important because your grandfather my was grandfather one of these was children. John James Rowley was, uh, and uh, I lived till I was ten years old with my grandfather. He never told us. Never talked about. No, it. never, never, never. It was kind of a shame. Even during in 2009, when we had that debate, I asked a member of my party to do the speech because I know her father was a British home child. So I said, I'm speaking more often than you. Why don't you make the speech? And she asked the family, and the father said, no, don't reveal that. So uh, my grandfather never told us about that. I knew it when I started touring in Canada after being elected in Ottawa, and uh, uh, people were telling me, you don't like English people. I said, well, my mother's name Rowley, my grandfather was John James Rowley, an orphan who came in the, uh, I'm a bloke who turned black. That was my, my line. And they said, well, most probably your father was, your grandfather was your British home child. I said, what is that? I didn't know about it. And I would say that I think 99% of people in Canada don't know what are the British home children, what they were, and how it happened. Your grandfather was lucky, though. He was with yes, a good family. Yes, he was family. lucky because he ended up in a, in a good family. When he turned 16 or 18, we still don't know. He, he was sent to Canada on the farms. And at that time, immigration was taking uh, the agriculture ministry department was in charge of immigration. Mm -hmm. It means a lot. <laughs> so he was sent on the, uh, in Montreal by ship. He ended up in Ottawa, waited two days at a train station before a family came there and picked him up. So he worked on the, on the farm, but in a good family. Being a, a member of parliament for so many years, being the leader of the separatist party, the Bloc Québécois for so many years. You had a conversation recently with uh, Prime Minister Trudeau. How's he doing in his first year and a half? Uh, size up or Well, I think he did well doing? in Washington, I told him. Uh, on other things, it's not clear. I mean, a lot of what he called conversation, a lot of consultation, but uh, uh, decisions, decisions we're not sure at all. Uh, the pipelines uh, through Quebec, no decisions is made, uh, but uh, he was supporting it during the campaign and still supporting it, I think. Uh, this he, would bring oil from the tar sands and also from uh, North Dakota, Bakken crude oil, east. That's it, and, but uh, that wouldn't be refined, neither consume in Quebec, so we're taking all the risk. Uh, it's different with Earnbridge. We supported the P Earnbridge pipeline because it, it's refined and consumed in Quebec. That's quite a difference. But uh, uh, otherwise, I don't see what we, we should... Uh, and Mayor of Montreal, Denis Coderre, is against that. Mm -hmm. And most of Quebecers are against that. So we'll see what he, he, he will do. You mentioned the Prime Minister's trip to Washington. One thing he does have in common with President Trump they both support the Keystone XL pipeline, continuing yes. and finishing that. Yes. Is that important for Canada? Well, that's a decision concerning the rest of Canada. It doesn't concern Quebec. True. So uh, that's their decision. I think, uh, on the other hand, uh, the pipeline for uh, going through Dakota, First Nations over there don't agree with that at all. So there'll be a lot of discussions till it be made. What do you think of Mr. Trump? What impact will that have on U.S.-Canada well, relations? Well, that's certainly what I should, could say is a phenomena. At least we can say. Uh, a lot of contradiction. When I, uh, I heard a speech yesterday to Congress uh, saying we should stop uh, uh, sending or uh, fabricating our, uh, in chi our things in China, well, make America great again. That was uh, done in China. A lot of the Trump's uh, thoughts are done in China or Ethiopia. It's tough to understand how could you be such in a contradiction, saying one thing and doing just the opposite? And I think the, the real test will come when we'll see the decisions he, he's making, uh, the effects of that, and two years will be election of the Congress. He has to deliver. And uh, the links with, uh, uh, we don't even know the uh, his income uh, report was not uh, printed, re produced, made returns. public tax. Yeah. Re uh, does, did, is he having or was he having a link with uh, Russia, with uh, South Korean banks? We don't know. Transparency is certainly not uh, one of uh, his quality. Are there worries in Quebec in particular, Quebec being such a huge trading partner with the U.S., uh, New York in particular, worries about 
reworking NAFTA, worries uh, about the impact it could have on trade? Yeah, it, it, it's important, and we were, the sovereignist movement was supporting NAFTA and free trade, first of all, in 1988. It was not of Quebec, by the way, there'd be no free trade, because Mulroney in 88 lost in the rest of Canada, and he won the election because of Quebec, supporting the free trade agreement. So we're for free trade, obviously. And uh, there's certainly a difference with Mexico, but there's interest in the states also uh, maintaining the, this free trade agreement. Mm -hmm. And it is something to say I'll change everything without knowing the consequences of changing everything. So I don't know how he'll do that, but uh, just like asking people in Mexico to, to pay for the wall. It's tough to, uh, you know, politics is something else than uh, twitting. He does that quite a bit, doesn't he? Oh, he's better at that. A lot of refugees are fleeing the United States, fearful of what his immigration policies may be, and fleeing through northern New York and into Quebec. Uh, the Prime Minister has said that, that he is going to allow them to keep coming. There has been some opposition raising questions about the, the, uh, the security and the resources being spent to welcome these refugees. What's your thought on that? Should they be allowed to come into Canada and Quebec and seek asylum? Well, I, I think that we have to, to, to uh, open the door to people who, who are coming, uh, uh, trying to find a safe country to live. They're not, certainly not choosing Quebec and Canada for the climate. I'm sure of that. No. Uh, in fact, some of them are nearly dying in some that's sections it. crossing that's the border. But uh, on the other hand, it's something to have an open heart, but you have to have the means to do so also. So I think the debate should, should be um, more realistic. It's not only saying that, come, we all love you, this is one thing. We have to be serious, but the problem is we have that treaty as a third safe country with the states. And if the states is no more a third safe country, if they make kind of judgment then differently than Canada is making, then we have a problem. We do have a problem. And uh, how can be done? We have to be certain we have the means to, those, if those people are coming, they, they have, they, they, we have to support them, but uh, how much that will cost? Uh, if we put that money there, where do we cut? And we have to have that debate. For so many years, you were the leader of the uh, Bloc Québécois. What do you see for the future of your party? History shows there's high and lows. We're certainly in the lows now. Because uh, in, in 1989, s sovereignty was supported by 30% of the population. A year after, 67%. So it changed a lot. I hope it will change. This is why I don't want to sovereignty. I don't want Quebec to be a sovereign country because I'm against Canada, but to preserve what we are, not against the other, but for us. But uh, we'll, we'll see in the, in the future, I, I hope. If not, uh, I don't want the, the grandchildren of my children to say, Grandpa, could you say a few words in French for me? Is now not the time, though? Is there not an appetite right now, both nationally and in Quebec, uh, for, for well, well, independence? Well, I think that over the years, there's always as an average on a, uh, a certain period of years, of 40% supporting sovereignty, 40% supporting federalism, and 20% going from one pole to the other depending on the situation. So we have to find the exact, the good timing to get a majority among that 20%. We almost did it in 1995. Right. We lost by less than 1%. Yeah. Yeah. But that was done democratically. Uh, there was no riot, nothing like that. I think that's a good thing in Quebec. So wait for the right time for a referendum. You, you think that time will come? I hope so. I hope so. And your future? Do you see a future where you're back in politics, either leading yes, I, the Bloc a, a, Québécois a, a, or... Uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, philosophers is uh, Yogi Berra. He said, I don't make predictions, especially those concerning the future. <laughs> and. Uh, we, know, we don't know when we come in politics. We don't know when we go out of politics. But I'm not uh, running after that. I think it's not the good attitude. The good attitude is not to make or not a career. The good attitude is to serve or not to serve.
to defend a cause or not defending a cause in politics or by other means. Is the fire still in the belly though? Is it something you, you're still passionate about? I'm still passionate about that. I think politics is, democracy is precious, precious. When people are saying, uh, why don't, we, why do we, should we go voting? Well, just try a good small dictatorship. You'll see the difference. Sometimes we don't agree with the people elected, of course, but we have the chance of choosing the, and changing the situation. And we should appreciate that more than uh, too many times we don't. Gilles Deceppe, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. It was a pleasure. Appreciate it.